Got it. Oh, I got, I got it. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> hi, hi, Kate. Um, I'm recording the speakers forum. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, we have Rich here, um, and he is a Muslim and a Sufi. Is that Sufi. right? Sufi. Sorry. <laughs> um, and he's also a, a member of Bat Olive. Thank you. And he has been a student of world religions and involved in the interfaith dialogue for 50 years. Um, so he says anti-Semitism is on the rise again, both from the left and the right. Um, much of the anti-Semitism on the left is due to ignorance and misinformation. One of the biggest ways to combat this is by getting to know others and letting them get to know you so that dialogue and the correction of false information can occur. Um, interfaith dialogue and knowledge of other faiths can provide you with some of these tools. So in this talk, he's going to uh, present why this is so important and how it can be accomplished. Um, so with that introduction, I'm going to hand it over to Rich. Um, and yeah, enjoy this conversation. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, first off, uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, as, as Melissa said, uh, you can throw in uh, questions or comments anytime during the talk. Uh, I would like this to resemble a dialogue as closely as possible. <clears throat> um, I also wanted to add a brief, uh, a brief thing in the beginning about what a Sufi is, so that you know, folks know. Sufis are the mystics of uh, of Islam. Sufism is to Islam what Kabbalah is to Judaism. Uh, the word Sufi me, has to come from the root of the word wool because of the brown wool robes they would wear. Um, I belong to, uh, there are several orders of Sufis. The one that I belong, I belong to two. One is the Mavlevi, which I'm sure you've all heard of. That's Rumi and the whirling and all that. Uh, <clears throat> And the other is called the Anaity, and the Anaity is heavily interfaith. So although most Sufis, I, I would say, are interfaith, um, the, the, uh, the Persian poet Sadi, himself a Sufi, advised us Muslims to keep one foot firmly rooted in Islam while walking the world of belief with the other. So that being said, um, one thing of great concern to all of us is the rise of anti-Semitism. Between 2016 and 2017, anti-Semitic attacks in this country rose by 50%. Uh, those of you who would like can extrapolate in what happened in 2017 that made that possible. But they have, and they've continued to grow. 2021 was, they say, one of the high, the, and this is the, the ADL, uh, says that it was one of the, the highest for anti-Semitic attacks um, in the century. Now, a reason for this is ignorance. It's not the only reason, but it is a reason. And the reason why I concentrated on the left, it's not that ignorance, it's not that anti-Semitism in the right is and based on ignorance, but historically they seem to be happy remaining ignorant and trying to convince them otherwise has pretty much been a you know, time wasted. You know, uh, anti-Semitism is such a part of the right worldview that, <clears throat> you know, I think without it, they would just crumble and disappear. On the left, they're now, the idea that this is new, you know, I, I want to disabuse you of that. On the left, there's always been anti-Semitism, but not to the degree that it is there now. And part of the reason for that is ignorance. 
ignorance about Judaism, ignorance about Israel, ignorance about the average Jew. If you think about it, when I say the average Jew, and I say that with quotation marks, there really is no such thing as the average Jew anymore than the average Muslim or the average Christian. You know, and, uh, you know, to give you an example, uh, I, I have many most, you know, many people when they think of Muslims think that they're all staunchly anti-Israel and I won't deny that a majority are. But it is amazing how, you know, how many I run into who aren't. Uh, one difficulty that we have in dealing with people and it's something that we deal with. In what? Excuse, excuse, one difficulty is what? That we have when dealing with people, particularly, you know, in an interfaith dialogue is you can't lump any one group together as monolithic. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I I was sitting at a, at a breakfast table in a restaurant every Saturday morning. My son and I meet uh, a friend of ours who is a deacon in the Episcopal Church, <laughs> and uh, we have breakfast. We call it the uh, the theology nerds breakfast, and we get together and we discuss various theologies. And he brought this lady along. Okay, and. This was right after that uh, that journalist was killed on, on the West Bank. Okay, and a lot of controversy about that. Uh, one of the difficulties is neither side trusts the other. And if you look at history, how can you blame them? But, um, and so trying to find out what the truth is has been very difficult. Well, he had brought, like I said, Mark had brought uh, a friend, someone who he knew, who, you know, uh, immediately started the conversation on that with all Jews are. Now, when I hear that, my hackles go up. Okay, because all anybody isn't, you know, and you can't say one group of people. But as far as she was concerned, all Jews are fascists. All Jews uh, support the, the suppression of the Palestinian people. And, you know, and so forth. And I said, well, now, wait a minute, you know, because I can't keep my mouth shut. So I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to examine some of what you said. Okay. I know Jews. I know Israelis who are appalled by the government stance on the West Bank. I said, so you can't say all anybody here. I said, we've already had one prime minister of Israel die trying to get a peace process going. And he wasn't killed by Palestinians. He was killed by a Jewish guy from the settlement. You know, well, right away she goes, you know, well, we're being with a fascist. So I'm like, oh my God. You know, it's like, I'm not going to get anywhere with you, am I? You know, but what it illustrates for me is someone who is basing all their opinions on little knowledge. Because she said, and she brought up, she said, well, you can't tell me I've been to Israel twice. I said, okay, you've been to Israel. I just, Listen, I've been to Iowa twice. I don't know how to grow corn. You know, um, <laughs> but uh, I said to her, when you were in Israel, who did you go with? Okay, she went with a church group, which is fine. But, you know, it's a church group that, you know, wanted to study, you know, problems in the Middle East. Okay, who did you talk to? Well, pretty much from the time they hit the tarmac until the time they left, everything that they got was a Palestinian narrative. 
you know, they were met by, by Palestinians. They were immediately ushered to the West Bank. They never had a chance to talk to any Israelis. They never had a chance to talk to, uh, you know, to get, you know, both sides of the history, both sides of the narrative. You know, uh, one thing that, you know, Rabbi Olivier is very big on is that you learn both sides of the narrative. You know, and, you know, you have to, and I, and I told her this, I said, you know, understand, I said, I want to respect you. I want to respect your views, but I have to tell you, I don't think you have enough knowledge of what's going on there to make a decision. You haven't gotten to know the whole other side of, 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 of the argument. Well, she got very angry that she said that I accused her of being ignorant. And I didn't out loud. But, uh, you know, the point was, was that I couldn't enter into, into a dialogue with her because she didn't want a dialogue. You know, she, uh, we, we used to have a saying in the neighborhood, don't confuse me with facts, I have an opinion. You know, so, you know, here was the issue here. So my thing is, how can interfaith help us? You know, because there are some people who you're just not going to get through to. But there are many more that you can. And one of the best ways to do that is for us to get to know each other to the point that nobody is the other anymore. You know, I have seen wonderful work in, 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 in Seattle. Uh, between Jews and Muslims. You know, I've also heard some comments in mosques that would, you know, basically make your hair stand on end. Uh, but I've seen work among people in the Abrahamic faiths, and that's what I'll stick with tonight. By the Abrahamic faiths, I mean Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I, you know, I've seen them work together. Now, one of the things you have to do when you work together, particularly in an interfaith project, and this is very important, is being a presence and being a representative of your faith and remembering nobody is asking you to change your religion. Nobody's asking you to change your belief. What we are asking you to do is enter into dialogue with other people, okay? For example, where does Christianity and Judaism, where are they alike and where do they part company? Okay, because they do to an extent. Uh, I remember uh, Rabbi Olivier gave a talk at Interfaith Community Sanctuary on the resurrection. <laughs> But now you laugh, but he got halfway through it before some of us realized, wait a sec, he's not talking about Jesus here. And he wasn't. He was talking about Isaac. And Isaac. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, exactly. I've, I've, got, I've still got his speech because he gave me a copy of it. But uh, <clears throat> yes, he was talking about that and the stories in the Mishnah about what happened to Isaac after the supposed sacrifice of Abraham. You know, and uh, I don't want to get into it too deeply because A, it's the rabbi shtick, and B, that's not what this is this talk is about. But basically, there is a, a belief by some that Abraham did actually sacrifice Isaac on, on, on the mountain. And then Isaac was taken up to paradise where he waited for 40 years until Abraham sent to, uh, to find him a wife. And then when, when he did, when she showed up, he came back down out of the cloud. So, uh, and that's in the mission. What's the Islamic so, story? Well, I don't, you know, there isn't one. I would, I, I, I shared it with some friends of mine and they're like, well, that makes sense. You know, but uh, there, the, you know, there's nothing in Hadith. No. That teaches that. No. 
you know. Uh, but there's nothing in Hadith that teaches different either. The other yeah. issue too with, with Islam, you know, is that, you know, they think that it was Ishmael who was sacrificed, not Isaac. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my view is, uh, what does it matter? It's a wonderful story. You know, because I'm, I'm with the rabbi. I don't think that stuff actually happened. You know, yeah. the Torah and the Quran are not history books, guys. <laughs> you know, and uh, a big mistake we make is when we think they are. Uh, I, uh, in Russia, in the mid 1800s, there was a huge slaughter of a certain portion of Russian Orthodox, of the Russian Orthodox, who ended up having to flee the country. They, they went to Alaska and to the, and to the Northwest coast here hmm. uh, because they were being persecuted by the rest of the church. You know why? Because they held their hands different when they made the sign of the cross. Hey. I know, have you heard anything so stupid in your life? But yes. I've heard yeah. worse things, but yeah, okay. Yeah, see, I grew up with, you know, uh, in Greek Orthodoxy, with you hold these two fingers with your thumb and you keep these two out. So these three signify the Trinity, and these two signify the dual nature of Christ, human and divine. You know, which, and I think the whole thing's BS, so, you know, it doesn't matter. But these folks were holding it with, with three, three fingers. Right now, but. So. But yeah, so it's it is silly the things that we will, you know, slaughter each other over. Uh, I can tell you stories just as bad from Islam. Oh, that's sweet. But uh, as a matter of fact, the first uh, the first slaves that came to this country were captured by African tribesmen in a war. What people don't realize is. Yeah, the right. ones who captured the ones yeah, in the war, on, 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 they were all Muslims, but they thought that the others were heretics. Well, so they thought it was okay to enslave them and sell them off. <laughs> yeah. You oh, know, the world we live in, eh? Uh, in any event, when you're getting back to this, when do you enter into interfaith and into interfaith dialogue? The point is to try to understand the other, not to convert them or be converted by them. Um, if you enter into interfaith dialogue, say, with me, I'm not expecting you to say your shahada and become a Muslim. You know, uh, it's more like we get to know each other and understand each other. And as we do, we come to the realization that we're really not that different. I mean, we, we all kind of want the same thing. We want security. We want love. We want peace. You know, uh, Freud says everyone in the world wants two things, love and meaningful work. Yeah, you know, I can tell you as someone who works in psychiatry, there is not much that Freud said that I agree with, but that's one of them. Um, so let's say you're, uh, you're brand new, you're going to something, uh, you're coming to Interfaith Community Sanctuary when we do the celebration of Lilat Al-Qadr. Now, Laylat al-Qadr is one of the holiest days in the Islamic year. It comes towards the end of Ramadan. And it's when we commemorate the revelation of the Quran. You know, and uh, unlike Christianity, which indeed is Christ-centered, Muslims, the Muslim religion, the Islamic religion, is not Muhammad-centered, it's Quran-centered. Just like Judaism is not Moses-centered, it's Torah-centered. Doesn't mean you don't respect and love Moses. You do, but your religion is based on the Torah. In Islam, doesn't mean we don't love and respect you know, Muhammad. 
But our religion is based on the Quran. Okay, both of these are considered the word of God, whether you accept that literally or uh, in, in a figurative sense, up to you. But the point is, so when you're, um, there's something that Jews and Christians have in common, or Jews and Muslims have in common. And if you get a chance, Jacob Neusner, who's a, who's a wonderful author, uh, actually did a book comparing uh, Jewish law and Islamic law. And what he was looking at wasn't, you know, gee, they both have a law forbidding pork. You know, that was what he was looking for. What he was looking for was how do they make law? It's like uh, in Judaism, you have the Beit Din and you have Halakha. This is how law works. In Islam, you have Sharia, which has been taken totally out of proportion by our media. But this is a wonderful topic for interface. So how do you figure out what is legal and what isn't? What do you, you know, how do you do that? You know, and do you always need to do it? Uh, for example, uh, there's a wonderful movement now in Judaism called Neo-Hasidism. I'm fascinated by this. And one of the things that I like about it, you know, besides its, its emphasis on Kabbalah and on mysticism is how it approaches the law in Judaism. Okay, unlike, uh, unlike Hasidism, which is another, uh, you know, movement in Judaism that basically came out of Kabbalah in one way. This looks at the law more from a reform standpoint. So for example, uh, one of the leading proponents of it, Rabbi Arthur Green, in discussing kosher, talks about it from the view of a green kosher. And what he means by this is, if you must eat animals, what animal you eat is not nearly as important as how it was raised. Was it raised humanely, okay? Was it, you know, like free range, grass fed, that type of thing. But he adds, truly as the race evolves, the new culture needs to move towards vegetarianism or even veganism. And there's a movement similar to that in Islam called the new halal. Now, there aren't a lot of Muslims yet following it, you know. Islam needs to grow in, in, in you know, in this country, it's starting to and take some big steps. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm fond of saying every time I discuss things like uh, the new halal or women leading prayer or women doing khutbahs, which is our version of the bar, Every time I mention this, a sheikh in Saudi Arabia bursts into flame. So, you know, it's, we have a long way to go uh, to catch up with you guys. But there's a good topic for interfaith dialogue. Okay, where is Islam on these things? Where does the guy you're talking to, because he can't speak for all of Islam, he can't speak for himself. But where does he see it going? And you have to, when you do that, you have to take the risk that this person is a whole lot more conservative than you. And they may say some things that are gonna, you know, raise your hackles a little. You know, you can't always assume that they're gonna be on your side on this stuff. And there's some topics that at least in the beginning, in the beginning, until you get to know each other really well and develop some trust, there's some topics that you need to avoid to that point. But once you develop that trust, then you do need to bring up those topics. Uh, I know, you know it, it's interesting in, in two people who I love dearly and I've watched do this are, you know, Rabbi Ted and Jamal. And, you know, when they first started certain things, certain topics, they had to tiptoe around. But as they've gotten to know each other and respect each other as people, they've been able to broach those topics. Now, this doesn't mean we're maybe that we're going to necessarily 
come to a decision. But what it does mean is as long as dialogue is open, we're moving closer to that. You know, and I know that can sound Pollyannic, you know, but, and it would be, except for the fact that what I'm offering you here in the form of interface is not, okay, this is all we got to do. If we do this, we're going to solve the world's problems. No, it's way too complex. This is just an aspect. This is an aspect of something that you can do as an individual. You still need to be out there uh, voting and agitating and doing other things for the causes that are important to you and for the sake of peace and understanding. And we all need to do this. I mean, and not just people, it's like, for example, if we look at intolerance in the world, religious intolerance, okay, we see anti-Semitism. We see the persecution of Muslims in China and Burma. We see the persecution of Hindus in Sri Lanka. We see the persecution of Buddhists in China. Um, there's a lot of intolerance out there. So the topic doesn't end you know, with, with, with us and Irish as important as they are. Uh, we need to look beyond that too, to that bigger picture. But we need to, you know, think, you know, act locally while thinking globally. So for, for, for Jews, for Muslims in this area, it's my opinion that what they need to concentrate on is that rise of anti-Semitism. Uh, and, you know, one thing, like I said, we can do, uh, is come to each other's events, get to know each other. Okay. Um, we should be going to things like Leila Uh On the other hand, you know, Muslims should be coming to things like, uh, like Passover. We need to get yeah. to know each other. And those are one of the best ways of doing it. You know, the neat thing about Passover is the Seder is pretty much, okay, this is who we are. You know, if I defy anyone to go to a Seder and not come away with an appreciation of who Jews are and what they believe. Because that's the whole point of the Seder. It's, it's that story. You know, and with Leila Fokanda, we, we, we don't do a Seder, but we do read Hadith about, you know, uh, the first revelations of the Quran. You know, it gives people an idea of, of, you know, who Muslims are. You know, and then we can sit down and enter into dialogue with each other. Um, now, I've noticed, you know, and I mean, we still got some time, you know, but we got plenty of time, as a matter of fact. Yeah, so, so I want to say something to you, to Rich, in, in, in response to your, your plea for us to get to know each other and attend each other's events. Um, you know, I, it's some years ago now, back when I was more or less in my, in my Sufi mode, um, and there was an iftar during, uh, you know, during Ramadan, and uh, Jamal had arranged this, uh, this evening, for an interfaith evening for breaking the fast, et cetera, et cetera. And there were Christians there and a few Jews. I think I had not converted yet. Um, and, you know, Muslims, uh, it was a good sized turnout. Jamal asked me to chant the, um, the Surah of Fita, of Fatiha which I did and loved doing it. Uh, not a single Muslim spoke to me afterward. They all turned away from me. They all sat by themselves at a table, not mixing 
one bit with any of the rest of us. It was an amazingly strange evening. Uh, you know, so getting to know each other by going to each other's events and even trying to participate in their events by chanting, you know, from the Quran. Uh, that, you know, that didn't go well for me. And I suspected it could not go so well for other people also. Well, yeah, and, and that can happen. Um, I, uh, one thing, I love Jamal with all my heart. But he doesn't like conflict and he wants to make nice. That's the truth. Yeah. Had it been me, I would have gone to that table and said, go up and mix. You know, because that's actually an Islamic command. You're supposed to, you know, you're supposed you to, to mix. get to know each other. Right. Yeah. Surah 49, verse 5. Had we wished, we would have created you the same. Howbeit we didn't, so that you would get to know each other and vie yes. with each yes. other for deeds of righteousness. Yes. Okay. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, they were breaking Islamic law, and I would have said so. Of course, you know, as a Muslim, I can say so. Yeah. You know, and that's very true. This isn't easy, and it sometimes takes work. And I would say things have gotten a little better. And the reason why they've gotten a little better is because those folks at the table, their kids are starting to grow up. Yeah, yeah. And their kids did not grow up in a monolithic unicultural world like they did. Yeah, okay. Okay, and that's where I hold a lot of hope is with the American and Canadian children. Uh, for example, in, uh, you know, everybody talks about, well, at least in this area, talks about the Cherry Street Mosque, which is, you know, where Ann Holmes Redding is the Imam. We, we you know, when we pray, it's, you know, uh, integrated prayer, men and women pray together. Uh, women frequently lead prayer through the footsteps, et cetera, et cetera. What a lot of people don't know, because, you know, it's a greatly kept secret, is there is a huge mosque in Ottawa, El Tahid, that has been doing that for years. It is, it is a safe place for the LGBTQ Muslim community. Hmm. Uh, the the imam is this wonderful gay guy. He's married. You know, he and his husband pretty much, you know, run things at the mosque. They, they do have services on on Facebook. Uh, but if you look at the people going, these are all the kids of those folks and, you know, American converts to Islam. And I see that as, that's where the growth's going to come from. Okay, I see, you know, the old aunties and uncles, as we call them. You know, respect them, respect your elders, but, you know, I don't expect a lot out of them. Their kids are another thing. And a lot of these kids, and this is something you, you will identify with, Kate, I know. A lot of these kids feel really hurt and damaged by Islam in the same way you and I did growing up Catholic. Mm. And getting them back into the fold, you know, showing them that this isn't your mom and dad's Islam. Mm-hmm. You know, it has been a huge task, but it's an important task because that's where the growth is going to come from. I look at Islam today and I see Judaism and Christianity 500 years ago. But we got to grow a lot faster than 500 years. Yeah, yeah. To catch up with y'all. Yeah. You know, and Islam needs a reformation. And, you know, I, you know, we need to be reading scholars like Amina Wadud, who's a huge feminist Muslim scholar. Uh, people like Farida Shak, who's a South African convert to Islam and is forming what I would like to think of as a Muslim liberation theology. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, and these are the people like that, that, that we need to look at. And it's interesting. Uh, a good friend of mine who... Uh, 
teaches this uh, at, in the uh, Middle Eastern Department at Duke University, Scott Kugel, wrote a book called Homosexuality and Islam. And it was groundbreaking because he shows how some Spanish Muslim jurists were really pushing towards the idea that being gay is not a sin in Islam. That when they talk about the sin of Lot, what they mean is violating hospitality. It has nothing to do with that type of thing. And he wrote this book and it's a brilliant book. And if Shaq's only response was, well, it's really nice, Scott, but you didn't go far enough. You know, um, and so I hold out hope for that, but I also understand what you're saying, Kate, because I've seen that too. Yeah. You know, and you know, you also get a thing, and I have never seen this in Judaism. Okay, I have never seen anybody create a convert like they're somehow less than someone born into the religion. Yeah. You see that in Islam all the time. And it needs to be changed. You know, oh, well, you weren't born a Muslim, so you don't understand. Yeah, yeah. I got news for you, man. I mean, where I grew up, I understand full of crap, you know, in whatever religion it comes in. So, Rich, you know what? I'm going to interrupt for just a sec because I think you don't see that you have somebody else who is patiently and, you know, politely waiting to ask a question. I apologize. Go ahead, please. Um, oh, that must be me. That would, um, that would be you. But, I, but um, yeah, that was fine. I was, um, wasn't a problem waiting. Um, so this is maybe a little off topic. It is a little off topic, but <clears throat> it has more to do with your knowledge of world religion and philosophy. So, but I thought since you're here, I would ask you. And that is, if there's any way of, of um, <clears throat> giving just um, very brief comments about um, how uh, Kabbalah and Sufism are similar and different. And the other part of the question is, <clears throat> has to do with non-dualism. And I'm, I'm really not clear whether non-dualism is a central tenant of Kabbalah or whether it's just stressed in our particular congregation. Maybe you can clear that up for me too. But <clears throat> how that is treated, if that's treated at all in Sufism. Well, okay. Now, as far as whether all of Kabbalah is um, non-dual or not, I'm going to leave that for Rabbi Olivia. Which I have opinions on it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> because I do think that, that Kabbalah is generally non-dual. Sufism is pretty much non-dual. There are some... I would say that most Sufis are what would be called panentheists. Mm -hmm. Pan panentheists. Mm -hmm. Entheists. Entheists. Yeah, it's different than pantheists. The pantheists believe that, you know, the whole world is infused with spirit, so pretty much the mm. universe is God. Okay, that, you know, that God is imminent. That's pantheism. Panentheism also believes that God is imminent. That's tied in all of this. You're God, I'm God, etc. But God is also transcendent at the same time. Mm. You know, and, you know, to quote Kevia from Fiddler on the Roof, how did this come about? I'll tell you. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. It's a difficult concept, but yeah. But in, um, in Sufism, non-dualism is part of Sufism. Is that yes, right? it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, the other thing where they're, they're very much alike, uh, both of them look at divisions of the soul the same. It's not a thing of like, you know, there, there's one soul. Okay, they have that in common with the Egyptians. And, I, and, and my own theory is that all of this mystery stuff goes back to Egypt, you know, and, and Moses brought it out with them, as it were. But um, so you have that type of thing. Um, you have a lot of similar meditative techniques. Uh, they borrowed a lot from each other. It, mm. We have a practice that we do called zikr. And zikr means, in Arabic, it means remembrance. Mm -hmm. And it's a time where we're zikron, like... Zikron in Hebrew. Yeah, exactly. And we chant the names of God and so forth. And that. And uh, we have zikrs around here. And I'm telling you guys right now, open invitation. Anytime you want to go to one, you get a hold of me and I'll take you. But 
the point that I was going to make is back in the Middle Ages, you know, it is rumored that Maimonides' son actually held zikers, hmm. you know, in his house, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, and so there's, you know, you know, and so there's that, you know. Um, you know, I'm very envious of the rabbi going to Spain. I've actually, I've been to the house where Maimonides was born, but because I lived in Spain for a year. But um, yeah, they're, they're very similar with each other. I have a lot of friends who are Jewish who are also Sufis. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they also, you know, do, do Kabbalah, they're also Kabbalists. We have every year, and, you know, last couple of years we haven't because of COVID, but we would rent the Odd Fellows Hall. Mm. Uh -huh. And yeah. Yeah. we would, for the week of what's called the Urs, which is, the anniversary of the death of Rumi. And anyone dies, like you have a yard site, we have a call, mm. we call it an word, which literally means marriage. Mm. Mm. But uh, in any event, we had the words for, for Rumi, right? Yeah. And one year it fell during the high holy days. And one of our uh, most wonderful chanters, uh, a lady named Amina, she's wonderful. She started it not with chanting El Fatiha, which we did second, but with Kol Nidre. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Wow. Very well received. But um, yeah, so we have, oh. they have much in common. Okay. You know, Rich, I, I um, pretty much <laughs> wrote the book, booklet that, uh, that this, Trip to Spain was using, um, yeah. yeah, you know, and I was going to be on that trip, but I, the day before I got on the plane, I tested positive for COVID. Oh God! Uh, ne ne never, never developed symptoms. I, I tested only like for the safety of the group, but anyway, I'm the one who got left behind. Oh, after, I'm after, so sorry. After I wrote that freaking book. But, oh, but yes, it, it, one, it, of, one of the things that I loved about writing that book was, you know, I got to um, plug in some of my kind of, you know, my, my own thoughts and suppositions. And one of those was about the inter, interactions between Maimonides and the Sufis of his time. Right. I was so convinced in my, you know, it, from from my own studies, that uh, Maimonides, uh, you know, he, you know, he had some Sufi mm. stuff in him. Sure, he yeah. did, and and yeah. there was his dialogue and friendship with Ibn Rushd. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, no, absolutely, and the uh, you know, the Seljuk Turks, like, you know, Saladin and so forth, were, were all Sufi. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. And, you know, when you get to mysticism in any religion, yeah, this is where you start looking and going, you know, it's all the same thing, the global mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You yeah. know, it's just the window dressing. Mm. Yeah, mm. It's, it's all one. It's all one. Yeah. It's like, I remember one, uh, one Simcha Torah where I had Rowan with me, for those uh -huh. of you who met my son, you know, big He's game. A beautiful kid. Yes. Beautiful kid. Yeah. And uh, someone thrust the Torah into his arms. Uh-huh. And he had no idea what to do. And I said, dance with her. And he went, dance? I said, yeah, dance with her. Well, yeah. he started turning, doing the dervish turn. Ah, yeah, yeah. You know? Cool. And he ended up, I mean, kid was moving. He had to be doing 20 miles an hour. Wow. So he's, <laughs> he, he's, a, he's a real good turner. We call him <laughs> That's great. And yeah, but he turned with her, you know. Yeah. Another yeah. story. Oh, go on. No, you. I mean, I just want to say to Kate that it's obvious that a significant part of her went on the trip because the booklet went on the trip. 
and everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thanks, Norm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Norm. And God willing, when they do it again, you'll go. When they do it again, I will go if I can, and it will be a little bit different um, kind of trip, I think. I have the impression that this, this was mostly, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on food and <clears throat> shows and some good times. And I actually want to go for, I want to go for the teachings. I want mm. to go for being in that place. Yeah. Well, I can take him to the best darn paella in Spain. It's in a yeah. little, it's in a restaurant called El Capricho, which is in a little town uh, up in the mountains called Mijas. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, but no, I agree with you. I mean, and an interesting thing, and it's something to look at, which Spain is a lot of conversos and morescos mm -hmm. are reverting back to Judaism and Islam. You know, yeah. now, now that there's, you know, freedom of religion and stuff. And uh, it's wonderful finding out how many of them through the years and at great personal risk, you know, kept the traditions of Judaism and of Islam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is, as you know, there is Ladino, which is a, a Jewish language that's a mixture of, 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 of Spanish and Hebrew and that, and it's like the South European Yiddish. There's also a Muslim language like that called Moresco. Right. And yeah. they've recently discovered they were doing some uh, building renovations and hidden in a wall, they discovered a book of odes to the prophet written in Moresco. Wow. You know, wow. and that they think is like about 200, 300 years old. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it, it, neat stuff going on there. So be, before, you know, we're getting close. So before we leave, I did want to recommend a couple of books to folks if they're interested, okay? Uh, one is called Holy Envy, Finding God in the Faith of Others by oh, Barbara right. Brown Taylor. Okay. Wow, holy, that's cool. That, what a cool concept, holy envy. Yeah. And it's Barbara Brown Taylor. Okay. The next one, and this is one you probably already know of. You know, okay. Getting to the Heart of Interfaith. Oh, that one. Yeah, I edited it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> which is by, which is by <laughs> mentioned before, Pastor Don, Rabbi Ted, and uh, Sheikh Jamal. <laughs> and, Imam, and, and, uh, Imam Jamal. I know. The, on, on the cover of the book, it says Jake Jamal. I think it does. Yeah, yeah. It does. I'm going to give him a rash crap about that. Trust me. Yeah, I know. But uh, I, uh, hey, the other book that I want to quick see second. Yeah. Sure, go on. Yeah, yeah to Rachel. Hey, um, Rachel. I was just curious. Could you clarify what uh, Sheikh versus Imam, what the difference would be? Yes. For those of us who might not know. Thank you. Yes. And an imam is now, first off, to tell you this, I mean, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm sorry, man, that's what time it is. I got to tell you how to build a clock. But uh, imam means or can mean something slightly different in Shia Islam than in Sunni Islam. Uh, but for both of them, the concept of, you know, the everyday run of the mill imam is a prayer leader. He's the person who leads the prayers in the mosque. Yeah. Uh, a sheikh is someone who, because of scholarship in that, he's a, a like a religious judge. In Sufism, he's someone who is kind of like, for those of you who do Zen, a sheikh is like a roshi. You know, uh, that they give you practices and meditations and you know see how you're doing along the way and in sufism we call it getting baked well jamal does some of that he does do some of that you know uh and i i, I tell people that jamal is the gateway drug to islam oh that's good 
you know, that's a good way to put Jamal. God love him. I thought just like yeah. he's doing great. But yeah, he's the gateway drug to Islam. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he, uh, but uh, so, you know, in any event. He was I, my gateway uh, drug to uh, Judaism, actually, but never mind. That's, that's another no, story. That's, <laughs> that's great. You know, I mean, you know, and it's like, um, so that's the main difference between an imam and a sheikh. A sh th th their function is a little bit different. Uh, and uh, the other thing in uh, Shia Islam, uh, the Shia believe that the only true leaders of the religion have to be descendants of the prophet. Whereas the Sunni believe that leaders are like caliphs in that are, are, are elected by acclamation. Of the people, so uh, there are there are twelve imams in Islam, and they believe that the twelfth has gone into hiding, and will appear at the end of the day. You know that that's uh, you know, and he, he's kind of like he is to Shia Islam what uh, the return of Christ would be to Christianity, yeah. or for those who believe in it, the, the appearance of an actual flesh and blood Messiah. You know, I, I like, uh, you know, my belief in Islam is that uh, the 12th Imam is a spirit, just like the Messiah, and we will bring about its coming, you know, by, you know, uh, you know, to use the Jewish term, to come along. You know, we will, you know, we will bring that about. It's not a person who's going to come. That brings up an interesting question to me about you, Rich. Sure. Yeah. So okay, we know you're Sufi, but 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 in the in the bigger picture, uh, Sunni Shia. Yes. Which? Both. I respect the twelve Imam. Okay. I believe they were divine holy people, but I also believe that the leadership of Islam must be by acclamation of the people. That's Shia. Well, the Shia part is the respect to the Imam. Okay, okay. The Sunni part is, I believe that- Acclamation, the, okay, okay, okay. Should be the acclamation. I also believe, you know, the days of medieval Islam where we have caliphs and stuff like that, they're gone and thank God. Yeah. You know, though th that, that, that's like the concept of Dimi. I mean, you know, a protected people, but they're still second class citizens. Oh it's yeah, that was, that was the Jews in, uh, in Spain. And the Christians in Spain. You know, well, yeah, the, but, yeah. yeah, but the thing is, is it's, it's, it's a concept that was pretty advanced in 600 AD, but has somehow lost its luster over the centuries, if you know what I mean. I you just don't yeah, need yeah, yeah, I do. I know what you mean. You know, um, yeah. you know we're all the same. We all need to learn from each other. You know, I kind of like what, you know, Akbar the Great did in, in Mughal India. He actually had, uh, I guess you'd call them weekly seminars or symposiums in which he would invite leaders from various religions to, you know, have round table discussions, you know, and he guaranteed freedom of speech for all of them. And, you know, was this? Was Akbar the Great. And uh, yeah, so he would uh, have, uh, you know, Zoroastrian Magi with mm -hmm. rabbis, with Christian priests, Jesuit usually, you know, with uh, Sunni and Shia Imams, you know, with Hindus. And uh, it was fabulous. He also sent a letter proposing marriage to Elizabeth I. She apparently turned him down. <laughs> Rich, can I ask you another question? You can ask all the um, questions you want, Rachel. Great, great. But, well, I feel like it's turning, I mean, is it okay if it's turning into a little bit of a ask the Muslim, if that's okay? No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Betsy, you're entering into interfaith dialogue right there. Woohoo! Hey, success. That was one of your goals it. for this, so I'm in. Yes, as we <laughs> say in Islam, Eureka. <laughs> 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 
I didn't know that was Arabic. <laughs> Eureka! No, it's it's Greek, but you know. The <laughs> the yeah, I know. You know, go on, Rachel. So, you know, you mentioned back for yourself that there are aspects of the Sunni and Shia Muslim that, or Islam that, you know, you're connected with. What, um, I'm curious about the community at large. Like, you know, when I meet people, is it uh, like in the Jewish community, right? We're kind of all over the place. Everyone has their synagogue. They do it a little this, a little that. Here's their overall name, yet they do a little more or a little less. And so with, um, with Islam, maybe in America versus the world, I don't know if the answer might be different. Is that sort of typical where having beliefs that draw from different traditions in Islam, um, is, is that common? Are there many other people like that? And are mosques sort of stamped and certified as Shia, Sunni, Shia, Sunni, you know, mix? Well, I'm sad to say, it's sad to say, now in America, it's a little bit better, but, you know, in Europe, not quite as much, and in the Middle East and, and in Muslim countries, it's still pretty sad. Sunni, you, you know the old joke about, you know, uh, two Jews end up on a desert island, they built three. <laughs> I love it, love it, yeah. You know, and, you know, one for one to pray and the other for the other to pray in, and a third that neither would dare set foot in. Well, Muslims do the same thing with mosques. And unfortunately, yes, it's uh, in predominantly Sunni countries and Islam is predominantly Sunni. Uh, the big countries for Shia are Iran and Bahrain and parts of Iraq. But uh, the Sunnis have a history of persecuting the Shia. Mm. And um, the Shia have not necessarily in Sunni, in, in Shia countries like Iran, been very highly disposed to the Sunni. You know, this is sad, this type of religious, it's like Protestants and Catholics, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in Europe, like during the 30 years war, and it's sad, you know. It's, it's like a paradigm against the, uh, against uh, what, reformed Jews, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. Um, and things like that are sad. They really are. Uh, no matter what religion it is, it's sad. Uh, now, if you go to here, uh, the parents, it's a little tough. I know there was a there was a Sunni mosque in Bellevue that got you know up in arms because they discovered that Shia were were coming to it, and they didn't want anything to do with that and forced the Shia to build their own mosque. Which I just thought, I mean, or you know, so, you know, I mean, the rest of you know, Muslims here were going, oh, dude, you know, do you know how you're making us look, you know? But that is changing with the kids, once again. Okay. Okay, and that's what I'm looking for. With a lot of these, with a lot of the older people, and they're what we do call them the aunties and uncles, you know, and we do try to show them respect. You know, it's an interesting story about that. I, uh, at Interfaith, in the summer, we have a, a kids camp called Peace Camp. And I mean, it has grown. The lady who found it is a member of, of Interfaith, Gretchen. And there's an Interfaith, there, there is a Peace Camp in Uganda. There's ours. There's one in the Philippines. And it's to bring kids together from different, you know, areas in that and you know and let them learn about each other and stuff and uh generally there's a couple of counselors like you know anywhere from two to five who come from this orphanage in india called mahar and they're older and they come as counselors and um very sweet kids some of them are muslim some of them are hindu it's really not a super big deal with them I walked down there a year ago and two of them looked at me and went, uncle, I have attained uncle status. <laughs> this means I am old. <laughs> uh -huh. I have now, and it's bizarre <laughs> because we were having a dinner and I couldn't get out of my chair. Oh no, uncle, I'll get it for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
you know. I have some Bangladeshi uh, Muslim, uh, well, yeah, Jamal's family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Auntie to them, and no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to lift a finger. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. I turned to Rowan, he looked at me and said, don't even think, you know, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and it's a two. It's a, but so, you know, we do call these folks, these elderly folks in, in the mosque, auntie and uncle. Now, an interesting thing, if you go to India, particularly in areas that are heavily Sufi, okay, you will see Hindus visiting Sufi shrines and Sufis visiting Hindu shrines. And nobody seemed to have a problem with it. What, what, where the problem has arisen is all the money that has come in from places like Saudi Arabia. Oops. Which teaches a very strict form of Islam called Wahhabi, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. pretty much believes we're it and the rest of you need to convert or die. Yeah, go to you know? yeah. And what's happened is you have extremely poor countries like Pakistan and India. And suddenly, you know, they're saying, well, we'll build you schools and we'll build you mosques, but you have to put our teach our teachers and our imams in. There. So now you have an Islam that's slightly to the right of Attila the Han. You know, in areas that were known throughout history for their tolerance and openness. You know, that so that explains a lot because I remember the rabbi was talking about Pakistan. And I was really surprised. Now I understand the context of what he was discussing. Yes. I mean, because it wasn't this way. I mean, uh, you know, Muhammad Jinnah, the basically founder of Pakistan, is probably turning over in his grave. You know, he was very secular. He had never intended, uh, you know, for Pakistan to be an Islamic state in that sense of the word. So in any event, that's something that's happening. One thing we have to do in Islam is combat that like Wahhabi type of attitude. But yeah, you know, it's, um, I'll leave you with this, guys. There's a, a wonderful thing that they do in Morocco, and the rabbi can tell you about it. It's called Mimuna. And what it is is at the end of Password, uh, Password, yeah, the end of Passover, um, the Jewish community, which had basically sold its leaven to their Muslim neighbors, would buy the leaven back. And they would bake, you know, little sweets and cakes and cookies and that, things like that, right? And then they would invite their Muslim friends over to celebrate the end of, of, of Passover. Now, about once every 30 years, Passover also falls in the middle of Ramadan. And this was one of those. It won't, it won't do it again until 1047 or 2047. Uh, but during that time, they also celebrate what we call Iftar, which is the sun setting and the breaking of the fast. And it's a wonderful interfaith thing that has been going on for centuries in Morocco. You know, and, and we're starting to do it uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, Beth Amel Synagogue, which is a, a synagogue in Kirkland. And, uh, you know, the Church Street Mosque, Muslim groups that are part of uh, interfaith and with the interfaith community too. And we're going to be doing it every year, you know, uh, Mimuna. And we're looking at it as a huge chance for interfaith and for dialogue. That sounds really cool. Yeah, well, you know what? You're invited. Thank you. You know, you know, when comes come the time, you said it's around Passover next year, let COVID be gone. Um, it would be neat to start talking about that and even have like uh, where I could write down the details because. You know, I have a couple of Muslim friends, uh, not close friends, because for the kind of people that you see when you drop off your kids and you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in so long. How are Hi. you? You know, and, um, and in the situation of like one woman, uh, she's a pretty heavy accent. Um, and so I don't really enter into uh, religious talk with her because 
the, you know, we're busy talking about our kids and, you know, basic how's, how's the, the drop off line or whatever. But, um, but it would be fun to be able to, you know, invite her say to go to something like this, um, to be able to share a celebration together. I mean, she knows I'm Jewish, obviously I know she's Muslim, but um, to be able to have that kind of experience or, or I met some super friendly lady and uh, Fred Meyer, she was shopping for the celebration at the end of Ramadan. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was so proud of her culture. She was, cause like her kids were going crazy over the toy section. And um, you know what I mean? And it, it wasn't a situation, like I didn't disclose I was Jewish because um, one, I had to get out of the store pretty quickly because of my own errands. And, you know, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't know what to do with the situation. And I was really excited to hear her excitement. But again, it'd be nice to have places to uh, invite people to share the community where I don't have to really know what I'm doing because there are other people making it a safe space for everybody. Right. And you know what? I also want to suggest uh, a third book to you guys. It's called How to Be a Perfect Stranger. And what it basically does is it lists the different religions. And it's like, okay, if you go to a ceremony or a house of worship in that religion, kind of a generalization of what to expect. You know, and, and, you know, it's like, how should you dress for it? Things like that, you know. Uh, So it's kind of, you know, it's it's a good book to pick up. You can order it through, through Amazon. And uh, it'll, you know, take a, a little bit of the uh, the anxiety of of that uh, doing it. Or you can also call me to go with you. Uh, I have been in mosques, Buddhist and Hindu temples, Confucian temples. Uh, I'm dying to check out. There's a very small uh, religion in Vietnam called Cao Dai. You know, and my buddy Michael, who just moved to the South Side. So they just they, they just built a cow die temple next to his apartment. So wow. he and I are going to go and check it out. But uh, yeah, cool. you know, come, oh, come, you know, come with me. I'm pretty much at home in all those places. Yeah, I I love this conversation, Rich. Um, actually, my best friend is Muslim. Um, I w- she's also Bangladeshi. I know Kate mentioned Bangladeshi. I was in a Muslim wedding, and yeah, it was just one of the most open and gracious families and people. And they, yeah, they make sure you leave with plenty of food. And you know, I find that's so universal. Um, and we have so much more in common and, and we're just all trying to connect with one another at the end of the day. And I think that's beautiful that we, that you, um, you know, are talking to, to get to realize that, that human connection is, is the root of a lot of it. So, um, you bet that's the root of most of it. You know, Uh, Rachel talked about, you know, talking with this lady about their kids and that that's an excellent start. Yeah. Did, and did anybody have any last remaining questions for Rich? I know we kind of covered a lot of ground. Yeah. And if, if you're coming to Shabbat, you can always tackle me at the, at the service too. Yeah. We do have service this Friday and we have Oneg this Friday as well. So that's probably a good time to, to bring it up. <laughs> And I want to take a moment to uh, to thank Melissa for the wonderful work she does in putting these things together. Oh, and you're organizing. She's things. terrific. Uh, <laughs> Melissa is, terrific. is fabulous. I agree. Yeah. You guys are so, so sweet to me. Now, this is all Stu's doing. Stu puts this fabulous form. I'm just filling in because he's in Spain. So <laughs> I can't take credit for the for the Bali speaker, but I'm happy to, to be a substitute teacher today. <laughs> yeah, you can you can take credit for your own really very good work, Melissa. Yeah. Yes, you're a hidden, you're a hidden jewel. You oh, really are. You're so kind. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, so thank you. in any event, i you know, if there's no more questions, I'll, I'll I guess you know, I wish you all a good night. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome.